Well, welcome everyone to this Friday edition of Family Talk. I'm your host, Dr. James Dobson, and I hope you know how much we appreciate you listening to our daily programs and for the many ways that you support this ministry. One of my greatest concerns is with regard to the next generation that's coming along behind us. I'm talking about the children. Uh, Children who are struggling in school and are being taught things that previous generations did not hear. Uh, But I'm also concerned about the adolescents today who are facing mental health challenges that are unique to this generation. And that's the topic that uh, we're going to hear today. My colleague, Dr. Tim Clinton, recently interviewed Dr. Matt Stanford. Uh, He is the CEO of the Hope and Healing Center and Institute in Houston, Texas. Dr. Stanford also serves as an adjunct professor of psychiatry at Baylor College of Medicine and Houston Methodist Hospital. Their conversation today is going to focus on those uh, challenges that teenagers experience and what can be done to properly care for and love them. I do hope that this discussion will be very helpful to parents out there who do have adolescents who are hurting and need help. Here now is Dr. Tim Clinton and Dr. Matt Stanford on this edition of Family Talk. Matt, thanks for stopping by uh, and joining us on Family Talk. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. As we get started, Matt, um, we have a brand new grandchild. Her name's Olivia. I've just gone crazy over her, uh, and she calls me Papa. And But it's reminded me so much of how vulnerable and how significant it is to uh, pour into the lives of our kids. You know, when you look at what's happening on social media, the stories you're hearing, uh, people are petrified Absolutely. about what our kids are going through, just on the net. Um, and this teen suicide problem is exploding. Matt, what are you seeing with our kids? Absolutely. I mean, there's a clear increase in suicide in uh, younger individuals. I mean, just near uh, where the Hope and Healing Center is located in Houston. Just uh, two weeks ago, a eighth grade boy hung himself. I mean, you almost never heard of that in the past children that young committing suicide but you're seeing increases in uh, mental illnesses you're seeing increases just in general anxiety you're seeing increases in self-harm and in suicide it it really is uh, overwhelming and uh, i think if we don't uh, really move forward and try to be proactive in this we're going to lose a generation very very early yeah our chart um a friend of ours years ago wrote a book called stressing your child Mm -hmm. And Andy, he talked about how he was citing, I think, Wall Street Journal or something, uh, that kids are reading, writing, and rushing by age five. And he said some of them are developing ulcers, and we're seeing clinical issues in kids. And it's like, you're kidding me. But, Matt, it's happening, isn't it? We're seeing depression in children and more. Absolutely. You're seeing depression in children six, seven, eight years old. Uh, half of all chronic mental health care conditions are in place by 14 years old. Half of all chronic mental health care conditions. Imagine that, by 14 years old. And so, you know, what we've done is we are absolutely stressing our children to death, literally, uh, with unrealistic expectations, both academically and socially, with uh, uh, excessive uh, moment-to-moment access to incredible amounts of media, to bullying online, to uh, just a, just a lack of a breakdown of uh, supportive discussion and ability to be personal with one another and present with one another. You know, they have these faults senses of security with one. They think they have uh, 10,000 friends when in reality they've only met one of them ever. Uh, So it's a real problem. And honestly, not a lot of people are talking about it. I mean, they're saying we've got a problem, but no one really is coming up with any kind of solutions. I I think maybe it's just like we don't want to believe our kids are having problems. And so we may label them like extra effort kids or maybe they're difficult children. But Matt, help us for a moment. How do I know when my son or daughter has tipped the scale here a little bit and they're in a spin? Right. There's trouble in the house, and we may be ignoring it, but signs are showing up and, and right. things aren't okay, 
and no, that's we've got to get honest with ourselves. And that's what, you know, that's what parents ask a lot of times. And normal in a child is a huge range. We have to understand that. Sure. Because, you know, when you're, when you're born, the range is very, very large. And as you get older, the well, range gets smaller. temperament, personality, Absolutely. all kinds of factors So, in there. you know, it's a, it's a big tent when it comes to children. So that makes it a little bit difficult. But what you have to ask yourself are the behaviors and the cognitive issues and the mood problems or whatever it is you're seeing your child, are they outside the range of what you would expect from an average child of that age? Uh, is the child able to deal with stress appropriately and with these? Are they able to come up with working with you with coping strategies and able to overcome them? And then what is their functionality? Are they actually able to get through a day of an average, say, eight-year-old child uh, even though they have these problems. If they're not, then you've crossed a line into disorder. If they're shutting down on you. Absolutely. You've crossed a if line. If they're withdrawing. Absolutely. If and they're crying they're, all the time. They're not able to function in school. They're not able to maintain their relationships. Exactly. They're, they're clingy. They're weepy. They're, they're doing things that are different than an average child who, say, is under some stress then you need to bring in a mental health care provider. And there's no shame in that. Let a mental health care provider be the one that tells you, hey, you know what? Your child's just dealing with some minor issues. It's not going to be a big problem. Or be a mental health care provider to tell you, hey, thank you for bringing your child in and catching this early. Because if we catch this early, we can take care of it. Yeah. Matt, what are some common things you're seeing in kids? Um, just two or three of them common clinical diagnosis type things? Well, I think, you know, in children, the, the number one diagnosis is ADHD. And in adolescents, the number one diagnosis is anxiety. Overall, though, anxiety is the most common problem in children and adolescents, and I'm just seeing it skyrocket. You're just seeing more and more children being brought in that are struggling with anxiety issues. I, I know you're saying our kids are under pressure, but what do you think really is tripping the switch here? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. Number one, I think we have unrealistic academic and societal expectations for children way too early. So an example I give a lot of times is, you know, I'm 53 years old. When I went to kindergarten, which at that time was an option, my, you know, my parents' friends thought they were odd that they sent me to kindergarten. There was no expectation that I would be able to read when I came out of kindergarten. It was just colors and shapes and fun. And, sure. you know, nowadays when a child, I've literally seen children coming out of kindergarten that if they weren't reading at a certain level, they were labeled as learning disabled. So what changed, the expectation or the children? And so the expectation is different. That's bad enough in and of itself. The other problem is we absolutely are not teaching our children how to be resilient. They have no skills to deal with any loss, stress, or problem because they have absolute immediate access to all information and to almost anything they want. The smallest thing occurs and they completely fall apart. They're unable to deal with stress. And, you know, and I'm not some get on a soapbox about the, the infamous uh, participation trophy, but, uh, you know, within certain uh, range with appropriate support, it's an important thing for children to learn how to lose. It's an important thing for children to learn how to deal with stress. Uh, and I think what parents do now is they basically try shield to them. They kill themselves to shield their children from all possible. Don't want their kids to go through what they went through. Absolutely. And, and I understand that. I'm a parent myself. We overprotect, overprovide. Right. And, and, and in the long run, it damages them because they're not able to deal with those things. They don't learn how to do it early. So later, when those things happen, and those things are much more serious and severe later, they fall apart. And then I think finally the social media, which is the disconnection. Uh, not that social media in and of itself is bad. It, it gives a false sense of connectivity to others when in reality what it does is it actually distances us from others. So we have fewer people to talk to, uh, work out our problems, uh, and to understand how others deal with their problems. Matt, let's go deeper here for a moment. Um, my son or daughter is in trouble and I know it. I've got to get some help. Mm -hmm. People don't talk a lot about where to go for help for kids right. at this level. I know that schools are adding school counselors and more, but we really don't know the school counselor, probably don't trust them, right. you know what I'm saying, and more. Where do we start? Right. Uh, who do we look to? Uh, probably the easiest and quickest path is to go to your pediatrician. Uh, and talk to your pediatrician about the, the mental health issues that your child is having and ask the pediatrician if they can help you get into a child psychologist 
and or a child and adolescent psychiatrist. You want to take your children and your adolescents to individuals that have been trained in child and adolescent psychology and psychiatry. It's just like if you had a cardiac problem, you go to a cardiologist. You want to go to someone who's trained to work with individuals that of that age, especially with a psychiatrist, because if medication comes into play, you want to make sure you have somebody that understands children. Exactly. And the work that's been done, the very little work that's been done with psychiatric medications in children, little children are not just small adults. They're different. The way their mental illnesses manifest are different. The way they should be treated is differently. And, and I would say this, there is hope. With proper treatment, it's like any other kind of condition. If caught early, uh, it can be managed and dealt with. Yeah. Matt, uh, one of the things that I, I was reminded of in grad school when we were studying kids was a lot of counselors apply adult models of psychotherapy or help uh, on the kids and that's not the way Absolutely. you work with kids not at all you hear people talk about the word play therapy um, play therapy sounds like oh, you're just going in there and hanging out and you know playing right. with Barney or something you know right. but it's nothing could be further from the truth it's entering their world of play which Absolutely. is where they live and you want someone who specializes in that area. Right. Children do not have the verbal and cognitive skills to appropriately express their feelings and emotions. You need to use things like play or art or music. There's all, but these are all evidence-based approaches to care and therapy. They're, you're not going to be able to sit down on the couch and, you know, Dr. Freud is going to talk it out with your eight-year-old son. <laughs> no. That, imagine you sitting down and trying to talk it out with your eight-year-old son. They barely will talk to you. So, so it's the same thing with medications. You know, just because a, a child is, is showing depression doesn't mean you just act like they have depression like a 25-year-old adult. And so we have to be very careful with that. So there's a very specialized approaches to care. There's very specialized approaches to treatment. Uh, you know, we haven't even really brought into the mix here the ideas of uh, things like neurodevelopmental disorders, like autism. I mean, there's a lot of things going on here that early on can mimic and look like one another, and they really have to be teased out. You really have to have an expert. So again, I would recommend that they start with the pediatrician, not because they're going to necessarily provide the care, but they should have the connections to the individuals to get them to the Care they need. You're listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Dr. Tim Clinton, your host, our special in-studio guest today, good friend, uh, and by the way, an expert, uh, Dr. Matt Stanford. He's the CEO of the Hope and Healing Center Institute in Houston, Texas, adjunct professor of psychiatry at the Baylor College of Medicine, and the Methodist Hospital Institute for Academic Medicine. Uh, he uh, has a brand new book out, you all, and uh, it's really significant. His book is called Grace for the Children, Finding Hope in the Midst of Child and Adolescent Mental Illness. Man, what a gift to us. Uh, by the way, if you're struggling today, if you need a word of encouragement, always uh, encouraging our listeners to go up to um, our website, drjamesdobson.org, or call us toll-free, 877 Seven three two six eight two five. Matt, I want to come back to um, a controversial subject, and that is kids in medicine, psychiatric mm -hmm. medication. Matt, what about our kids being on meds? The first thing I'll say that I'll say to anybody that asks me about meds in adults or children: there medication's you. wonderful if you need to take it. Okay, right. and you're taking the right medication in the right doses. One of the things you simply have to understand, and one of the things that I even learned is I'm a PhD in neuroscience. I mean, I love medication. I've studied medication. I've done drug trials my whole career. I mean, we do a lot of stuff with that. But even as I was writing that book, I was shocked. Somebody who's been in this, this business for 25 years, I was shocked how little research has actually been done on medication in children. There are very few antidepressants that have been studied in children younger than 10. There are virtually no antipsychotic medications, very few anti-anxiety medications. The vast majority of medications that we give children have never had a trial done in children of that age. I mean, that's shocking, yeah. too, and that's right. scary because scary. you think if your kids are on meds, that's pretty much a trial and error. Absolutely, and I think, you know, the thing that we have to keep in mind is not so much that the, you know, maybe we're giving them the wrong medication. You're taking a developing brain at its, at its height of development in that late childhood, early adolescent range, and we're just bathing it in a medication that's altering its neurochemistry. Now, if a child needs those medications and it's effective, wonderful. But you really have to make sure you're with a child and adolescent psychiatrist that understands what's been tested and what hasn't been tested so that they don't just, for instance, say, okay, well, I've diagnosed your 
eight-year-old child with bipolar disorder, which in and of itself is very, very controversial, diagnosing children right. that young with that. So I'm just going to throw medication at them just like I would a 32-year-old woman that I just diagnosed with bipolar disorder. You have to pause and ask yourself, how is this going to affect this child's development? Have these medications been tested? What is the cost? What is the benefit? And I think, unfortunately, because our psychiatric care, our psychological care is so insurance driven and driven by reimbursement, and you don't spend a lot of time with your clients, unfortunately, uh, we find that uh, the medications, you know, it's whatever I gave to the adult bipolar is what I'm going to give to the child that has bipolar. You know, Matt, um, Christian psychiatrist uh, Michael Lyles, he and I have had a couple of conversations along this line, and he said, Tim, when it comes to uh, finding a doctor and getting on some type of medication for these type of issues, he said it's important that you find the best Absolutely. psychiatrist. Absolutely. Uh, you want someone who has done their homework, even more than that, but someone who would do good med management. Absolutely. Matt, explain what that means, yeah. good med management. And, and Michael has, is spot on with that. And let me tell you what the first thing that everyone has to understand. The majority of people in the United States, children and adults who take psychiatric medication, receive those medications from a general practitioner or a pediatrician. I know. That is a bad thing. Okay, it's not to say that they don't have the medical uh, and some of them might get it right. It. I mean, and, and it, some and of them might get it right, and it's certainly a, a great way to begin, and it's a great way to bridge till sure. you have that. But if you were struggling with liver cancer, and your general practitioner said you got liver cancer, so come in next Monday, I'll start your chemotherapy, you would laugh at him. Okay, and he would feel like that would be the worst thing he could ever do to you. So he's going to send you off to an expert. So what we have to do is we have to get them to the, the proper individual. And so, you know, proper psychiatric care looks like this. The psychiatrist spends at least 45 minutes to an hour the very first time that they meet with you. They then follow you up at appropriate intervals after they begin the first medication. So I would say anywhere from two weeks to three weeks the first time you return, then you're back at a month, then you're back at two months, and they are giving you some measure of your outcome. They're not just saying, well, how you feeling, Tim? Because remember, we're dealing in this instance, in this hypothetical, with say a 10-year-old boy. They're not, you know, they're not going to ask Johnny how he's feeling, right. or you're not going to look to the parents and go, what do you think, he, how do you think he's doing? There's a, a real problem, say, for instance, with psychostimulants with ADHD. Uh, they're often given it a much too high dose initially and the parents will report that the child's doing much better but that's because they're so out of it that they lay on the couch and they don't cause any more problems wow. so the parents see them as not being a problem but their quality of life has been destroyed and so you need to talk to that psychiatrist about how is he or she assessing whether your child is actually getting better on this medication and the last thing I would say is this are they attentive to your needs in this way? If you have a question about that medication, can you get a hold of that psychiatrist? And how quickly can you get a hold of them? If you have to take your child to a hospital, is that psychiatrist giving you the number of a hospital to go to, and that's the hospital that they're gonna be able to see your child at? Being attentive, spending time. It's not that, you know, I heard Dr. Jones is really good, so I go to him, but he only spends 15 minutes with me, but hey, you know what, he's supposed to be the best in town. Well, if Dr. Jones only spends 15 minutes with each one of his clients, and he's the best in town, then you need a new psychiatrist in a new town. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm, I'm tracking with you, Matt, because I've seen this happen. Let's, let's stay with the med management piece. In a lot of outcome studies related to, like, treating depression and more, they talk about medication plus therapy. Mm -hmm. And a therapist can often step in and take responsibility with the parent on conveying back to the doctor, the psychiatrist, or whoever's stepping in there on what they're seeing for good and bad. Is that the same principle in working with kids? Absolutely. And, you know, when you're working with these illnesses, typically the research shows that medication and therapy together is always better than one or the other uh, by itself. Um, what you tend to find is if, if people are receiving therapy, they take less medication than, and, and they're able to get better results. What I would say is, you know, particularly when you're dealing with childhood disorders like ADHD and anxiety issues like that, 
Um, my suggestion is always start off with some type of behavioral therapy with a child. Behavioral therapy is incredibly effective uh, overall, but particularly effective with children. Start with some type of behavioral therapy and, and see if you can begin to get some momentum and change with that before you have to move to medication. Understand that medication is only for symptom reduction. Medication does not treat the underlying cause of any mental illness today. We don't even know what the underlying cause is of most mental illnesses. So before you start taking medication, start with some type of behavioral therapy. So for instance, with ADHD, I deal with that all the time. People bring their child in. They say, well, the, the, the teacher told us, and that's always a bad place to start, but the teacher told us to go. So we went, the pediatrician wants to put him on a psychostimulant. Okay, well, you need to take your child to a child uh, an adolescent uh, therapist or a child and adolescent psychiatrist and have them assessed to determine whether they even meet criteria for ADHD. Sure. Then if they do, you need to go to a behavioral therapist. ADHD be can be treated with behavioral therapy. Okay. You, you begin that treatment. If you're starting to see some progress after a month, then wonderful. Then we're just going to continue with that. If you're not seeing any progress, let's add in medication as an adjunct on top of the behavioral therapy. We hopefully will only have to add in less medication because we're doing the behavioral therapy. It's all about taking the least amount of medication yeah. for the shortest period of time. Matt, when it comes to uh, diagnosing a kid, sometimes a teacher will see something, but Johnny will be very normal, say over at church, or he'll be normal at Boy Scouts, or he's pretty normal with his cousins. And if, if you don't see this behavior across multiple contexts, then you're probably looking at something that's more situational, right? Absolutely. That, you know, we always ask people you know, how you're doing at home, in relationships, at school, or at church. You've got to look across multiple domains, multiple settings. If a child does wonderful at school, and he's always, you know, and, and your neighbors say, oh, thank you for sending him over. He's just the most wonderful child, but he's just out of control in your home. That's not a mental illness. That's a, that's a family issue. Sure. Uh, you know, if he's terrible at school, but he's just an angel and everything else, and he's the lead Boy Scout at Boy Scouts, Something's up. something else is going something on. Else is up. And so you need to think about that. So if just the teacher comes to you, but you also have to be honest with yourself. I've had uh, parents come to me and say, you know, the teacher says he's just, you know, a real behavior problem. But, you know, at home, he's just a boy. He's just being a boy. Well, be honest with yourself. Is he being an average boy at home, or are you just kind of putting up with more than the average parent would put up with because you don't really want to admit that he might have a problem? Yeah. Matt, um, we're, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, you're a big advocate for the church and engagement on mental health issues. Any, any thoughts there real quick about kids, the church, and mental health. We did a study a couple years ago in, with youth uh, leaders in the southeast of U.S., and 80% of those youth leaders said at the moment that we were surveying them, they were dealing with an adolescent that was struggling with depression at that moment. Wow. That's way beyond what you're seeing in the general population. So what we are uh, you know, suggesting is that faith communities, both in the child uh, section, the child ministries, and in the uh, adolescent ministries, are really kind of a first opportunity for us to recognize these problems and then to begin to help the parents uh, steer these individuals to care, but also a place to support these children, to help them learn resiliency, to help them learn to deal with their problems so that they don't have to carry these things on into adulthood out of control. So the church really, in my opinion, is the answer to our mental health care problem. The majority of people in the United States, adults and children that have mental health care problems receive no treatment treatment. Uh, that's an unbelievable statistic. And we know that adults, for instance, are more likely to go to a clergy when they're struggling with these problems before right. they go to a mental health care provider or physician. So God is sending these individuals to the church. That's not something I found. That's something the National Institutes of Health found. So that's just a fact. And so if we know they're going there first, the church is our opportunity to make an enormous cultural change. The secular world has no answer to this. They are struggling to deal with it. We don't have enough mental health care providers. We don't have have enough beds and now we know they go to the church so let the church stand up and lead in this area awareness access to care so much more we've got to do matt you've helped us uh, i think break down some of the walls here on the silence and the shame and some of the stigma that goes with this whole thing um, i'm going to give you a closing word to moms and dads i've heard this repeatedly early detection you're going to save your kids potentially years of brokenness. Absolutely. Step into this right now, mom and dad. Encourage them, Matt. I mean, if something's up, do something. There is no shame in illness, 
and you are not responsible for any kind of mental health problem your child might have, but you are responsible for getting them to care because they can't get to care. And I will tell you that when they get the care they need, the care that's most appropriate, they will get better. There absolutely is hope. Uh, and certainly in Jesus Christ, there's always hope. Find a faith community that's supportive of your family as you go through this journey, but find the mental health care providers that can care for your child. What a great broadcast, Matt. We got to do this again. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to a very thorough and hope-driven discussion about the mental health of our young people here on Family Talk. Dr. Tim Clinton has been our host today, and his guest has been Christian counselor, Dr. Matt Stanford. I'm Roger Marsh, and I trust you appreciated this conversation as much as I did. Are you looking for more practical help with one of the issues discussed today? Well, then be sure to connect with our friends at the American Association of Christian Counselors by going to aacc.net. Once you're there, you'll find additional resources and also the ability to search for a Christian counselor in your area. Again, that's aacc.net. Well, that wraps up our week of broadcasts. Thanks for joining us today and for faithfully supporting the ministry of Family Talk. Your generous financial contributions allow us to bring you relevant and timely conversations like the ones you heard this week. Consider how you can partner with us by going to drjamesdobson.org. That's drjamesdobson.org. Or you can learn more by going to the phone and calling 877-732-6825. That's 877-732-6825. Thanks for listening. Hope you'll join us again Monday for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Until then, have a blessed weekend. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.